Okay, this is our second class. Um, we're going to try this system. I hope that works. Um, as I said, we need to make sure that when you participate, try to speak uh, loud because we need to get the your voice and your question clear recorded in the in the system. And as we don't have any other microphone, that's why I ask you to move forward. So we will try the system now. So we started with the introduction of this course on Monday, and we talk about the power grid in general, and we talk about how we can generate uh, power. And I brought that uh, device, and I will move there. I should be here on the camera, perfect. So if you can come closer and you can, you can tell me here, um, please come forward. Um, I need to close this out. There. So I'm going to ask you to move around and we need to need to go to the camera so we can record this in the camera. The camera is over there. So if you come around, we can all see it. I think we are fine now. So what you see here is very simple. Uh, we build this with a science student from the University of High School. And basically we have a box here in which I attach and two permanent magnets. So here will work as one as a north pole and the other south. So for north pole, you will have magnetic supplies that are leading, and that magnetic supply will return from the south. So when they have that, and next to this, I put a, a wire turning 400, this is like 200 times, I think. And because when they start rotating this, then Sometimes the flag will go in because the north pole goes there. But as this rotates, sometimes the flag will not go inside the, the coil. When I rotate in the other opposite uh, direction, then north is here, the flag is being here, but south is here. So the flags are moving in the opposite direction. So as this turns, sometimes the flag will go there, sometimes will not go there, sometimes will come back. So by the law of induction, Okay, that change in flux and change in permanency will induce a voltage here at the turning point. So we want to test this and see how much we can generate. And we are going to help. So here we have an instrument. We're going to measure the voltage. And then we, we will use some uh, light bulb and see what we can get. Uh, and I need another system here that uh, what we need to do here, we need to rotate the shaft. So, and to do that, we can attach a turbine, but that, that's going to be hard today. So instead of a turbine, what we're going to do, we're going to wrap these around very tightly and, and in a system, and we, we need to keep turning these until we we have all the, the cord turned around the shaft. Okay. Yeah. And here, um, maybe we can move on, on that side so we don't lose the camera. Yeah, yeah. Go over there. And here I have this connector. This is going to be there. Yes. Yeah. So from the, the other side, there. And here we will have. One terminal of this coil connected here, and this is the other terminal. Because this is changing, this is a very simple setting. Basically, uh, we are measuring AC voltage. Yeah. So in this instrument, we're measuring the AC voltage, and just he's turning this, and look. We are already measuring some induced voltage in this little coil. There is 
nothing else. So the key here for generation is, is to find a source, a mechanical source that can contain the bug. That's all. What is that mechanical source? We discussed last Monday the hydropower. You have flow of water that can heat the turbine and create the rotation. It can be steam, high pressure and high temperature. If we pass the steam through a current, it will move the blade and create the rotation. What else? We discuss also what? Wind turbine, oh, wind also, air passing through the blades of a wind turbine can rotate it. So the key is just finding the source, the mechanical source that can create this rotation because by the law of induction paralyzed law, then if we have an um, adequate coil around this, we will be usable. So we put the instrument, and now you, be careful, don't destroy my device. You are going to pull it, and we're going to pay attention and see how much voltage we will generate. So to pull it, uh, I don't know, uh, we need to, I will fold it, or you want me to pull it? I can pull it. Okay. Yeah, let's see. Are you going to pay attention? Let's see how much we generate. Ready? It's at about 4.2 volts. 4.2 volts. Another thing we can do to measure this better, maybe put a drill here and we'll have a constant speed and we will have some cells. So, okay. uh, four volts, you said? Or two uh, two point? Uh, four point, uh, yeah, about four point two. Okay. So, the last thing we're going to do, we're going to put a light bulb. And the light bulb that probably is going to get burned, let's see. <laughs> let's see what we get. Maybe a full almost one. Do you think you can do it? Proximity of this to the environment. If this is far apart, 
the flux will not go all there. So the closer you get, the better for the generation. You will be able to generate more, more voltage and it will be more powerful. And the other thing, ideally, this coil needs to be wrapped around the magnet. And because of the simplicity to do this, it was hard for me to put the, the coil around the magnet because they have the shaft. So in the in a real design of a generator, this is more complicated than the head, this side, in this part of the coil, you don't have much induction. Uh, it will not affect the induction. This part here and here will be related to how much voltage you can create. But on this side, you, you will have no effect. So this is called the coil head. And typically here are moved around the shaft. On this side of the generator. But uh, that's the principle. So let's go back now to the slides and let's continue. You have a question about the generator. Um, so would a, uh, would like a ferrite core in that uh, wire loop, would that help with uh, getting flux in there or would the, is the air core? No, no, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, that's a good observation. So, so here in the in the coil, we, here we have an air coil, right? We don't have anything, but if you put some magnetic material here, you will be able to concentrate the flux and go through the coil. And a realistic machine will use that. Uh, in this case, for simplicity, because I wanted to make something that is visible, and yeah. I did it with air uh, an air coil. Yes. So. That's what we needed here. And in this picture, we have a description of thermal power plant. But the main idea here is find, finding a source that can create this mechanical energy. So in this case, it can be converting water into steam at high pressure, high temperature. And that steam can be created by burning coal or maybe using a nuclear reaction. So the process is very similar. Um, but also we talk about the thermal power plant that use the irradiance for the sun that also can create the steam for hydropower and wind, wind farms. The only difference of wind farms is that they do not use this principle. This is a very simple setting for a single generator. A wind farm, wind turbine, will use an induction generator, which is a little bit different. Uh, we will not have a, perm, a, a magnet like this. So the, the, the reaction will be induced in the rotor and that reaction with the stator will create the motion in the generation. So we talk about this, the system is complex, synchronized, what happened in one point will affect the other. So uh, several years ago, I received a student that, that uh, was studying to become a journalist and he needed to do a homework and he said he was interested in making an article about wind turbines and he found on the internet that I do work with wind turbines and he was wondering how come I am in Tennessee? Maybe they should be in another state, maybe Texas. So when I talked to him, he, well, he, he, he was not an electrical engineer so he didn't understand it concept of the power grid, but when we talk, I explain to him that this is a synchronized system. This is all connected. So what happened in Tennessee, actually, there is a failure or something major happening here will be spread all over the interconnection. The same thing is something happening in the Midwest. We will be affected. So wind farms are all over the country. So it doesn't matter if they are here or not. We probably will not have wind farms here because the, the topography is not attractive for that. Okay? So are the interconnections of the power grid, are they totally isolated or are there components like say, you know, one interconnection is suffering from a blackout, could another interconnection help out or is it just every interconnection is completely separate? Is it there? So yes, we, so, so good question. And we have three interconnection in the country, the Eastern interconnection, Western interconnection, and Texas interconnection, yeah. yeah, and we do have an interconnection between them, but it's not uh, 
uh, with high power. There's an, a little power exchange. So if something happened in one interconnection, there is no way that the other interconnection can fail. This situation might change in the future, but we need to have a different infrastructure because we need to uh, send large volume of power over long distances. And that's expensive, that's, that's hard. The only way to do it probably is with a DC transmission line. And there is a technology for that, but that can be very expensive. So that might appear in the future, but today we don't have that support. Yeah. Um, so we talk about the, the the blackout, and the main goal in the power system is to have this perfect balance between consumption and generation. If for some reason we not cannot keep this uh, in the long run, then we, we, we might have a blackout a problem, and that's what happened in 2003. We talk about the challenges. Uh, it's large. These are the, the, the largest uh, system created by the human kind. So the one here, or in Europe, or in Asia, a very large system. So we talk about the changes also, the concerns. So one of the concerns we will have we will study this course, this type of behavior, these dynamic uh, systems that are characterized by differential equations. So here we have one differential equation just to explain the concept that the changes in the frequency, this angular frequency, which is proportional to F, the frequency in the country, which is around 60 hertz. So that change in that frequency will depend basically on this, on a power balance. How much is being generated minus how much is being consumed? If these are equal, we're in balance, then the, the frequency will not change. But whenever there is an imbalance here, they are not equal, these can be positive or negative, and that will create a change in the frequency. So let's assume you have less generation than load. So this is going to be negative. And the change in the frequency will negative, so the frequency will drop in the future. This coefficient here is called inertia, has to do with how much kinetic energy we store in the masses that are rotating. So in this case, I have this uh, permanent magnet, so the mass is very small. Uh, but if you have a large rotor for a power plant that uh, is very heavy and the volume is large, then the inertia, the kinetic energy stored when this rotate might be high. So this parameter describes that. The higher inertia, the higher the kinetic energy you store. So when this term is high, that's good. Why? Because even when you have imbalance in the power, if this is large, the changes you might have in the frequency are going to be small. So what is the concern? Today, we're moving in a direction to increase wind uh, power or solar power, and they do not have that property, especially solar power. Solar power, you don't have any uh, mechanical motion, and you cannot store energy. So if, in the future, we need to increase the generation 10%, instead of doing with a conventional one, you use solar, for example, you will not get that inertia that the system may need. So with less inertia, what is the concern? Well, the frequency might change more. Yes. So in a previous slide, it was shown that wind uh, uh, wind generators are getting, like the turbines are actually getting, the blades are getting larger. Does that help with their uh, inertia, or is it just not significant in comparison to traditional thermal generators? Good question. So I said that solar do not have any energy storage no. at all. Yeah. But wind turbines, they do. They do. But it's still, in comparison with a conventional power plant, it's not significant. Okay. It's not significant. We can still use it somehow to help the system. But certainly, these, if we need to increase the generation 10%, these will not be increased as much as if we use conventional generation. Okay. That's a concern. Is the system going to be fine? Well, that's the concern. We don't know. Some people say, yeah, but I have my, my concerns, yeah. So I also ask you to check this. Uh, these uh, 
two slides with the picture here describe two problems we may have in our grade. This is one. So here, uh, these, these are obtained from the lab from Dr. Yili Liu. Uh, she has her lab here. You can go to uh, YouTube and see other animation. These are not animation. These are not simulation. These are real measurements. So you see here in the map, you have different points. These are measurement units that uh, she has in different parts of the country. And here we have the plot of how the frequency in all of these points are changing. Yeah. And when everything is fine, you know, the frequency should be around 60 hertz, but until we have a disturbance. And we talk about we might have a disturbance because there is a problem, a failure. And I think for this case, there is a fire in a power plant or a substation. So let me see if this. This work. Allow, let's see. Uh, I'm going to record this in the video. I think that it's working. And Grammarly. There it is. So imagine you're using Grammarly. You can hit rock bottom. Yeah. Okay. Oh, we, we missed that part. Let, let, let's, let's read that part. So, oops. Yeah. So, yeah, these were being collected by these uh, measurement units. And motivation, well, there was a serious blackout in a substation. There was a fire close to Miami. Um, so, and what happened? This amount of power um, uh, was disconnected from the system. Almost 700 megawatts disconnected because of this failure, this pipe. So, what is the impact of that in the eastern interconnection? This is what we're going to see in the animation. So, there is everything is fine, 60 hertz. And another another thing we need to pay attention here: if the, this is going to be animated with color, so if the color is red, it's because the frequency increased significantly. So red is 60.2 hertz. If this goes to purple, 59.8 hertz. So I want you to pay attention how the colors will change. So high frequency red, purple, low frequency. And this is originated here in, in, in Miami, but this is how the interconnection is uh, responding to that. Uh, and look at this part, how it still responds with something that happened so far away. Let's play it again, and I want you to pay attention how these colors change here and here and here. Red. Now this is red. Now this is red. And this is red. What do you observe from that simulation? This is not the simulation. Visualization. What do you observe? So if this is red at the beginning, uh, we have an increase in the frequency in this area where you have the failure. Yeah? And, but then on this part, it's doing the opposite. So the frequency is going down, but a second later, or around a second later, then everything is reversed. Now, this part of the country and this are increasing the frequency while this decreased. And then a second later, the opposite. So there is an exchange. Something is happening. So when you have more frequency, what do you think? The generator is spinning faster. What happened with the kinetic energy? You have more kinetic energy. So at one moment, these are gaining energy from somewhere. Where does this coming from? From the other generator on this side, because they're reducing, they're reducing their frequency. So the failure, what is causing? is causing an exchange of kinetic energy over long distances. These, these are long distances that are going all over the country, from here to here and here. And all these generators are exchanging energy. So you can see in the transmission line, flows of power going back and forth, right? So that's the situation. That is called oscillation. In this uh, animation, it seems that everything is fine because after 
a few seconds, the disturbance was controlled. The frequency came back to 60 hertz and everything is fine. But when would be a problem when this continued over time? When these oscillations do not damp, do not die and continue, because that can put the system in a risky situation. If something will happen, this, this might lead to a blackout. Yeah? And that happened in 1996 in the Western interconnection. An oscillation finally that, that was not controlled leads finally to another event that caused a blackout in the Western interconnection. So this is one of the problems we will study in this course, yeah? oscillation. And this is another one. What, do you, what can you say here? What is happening in this case? How this is different from the, from the previous one? You got a frequency that is changing. It's not just around 60 hertz. It was a little bit above 60 hertz, but then it came down. Then it moved all the way up. We see some changes here, so these are oscillations as well, but the most significant change is this average frequency that move a lot. So this is a different problem. What, what is happening here is the generators, they need to control how much torque we have in the shaft. This can come from water in a hydro power plant, right? Or it can come from steam. We need to burn or more, more or less, put more less, uh, put more or less heat to produce more steam. So they have a control unit, and that control unit is not acting well in this case. So there is a big event here. For some reason, the frequency went down, but here um, we can read the description, but. If you ask me, uh, some large demand in the system got disconnected. Here happened the opposite than before. A big chunk, chunk of load was disconnected from the system. You got more generation than load, and all the machine in the system speed up until this control unit that can control the torque and how much power you are getting from the machine start acting and control this increase in the frequency, stop it, and then reduce it, and try to stabilize the frequency back to 60 hertz. Yeah, so that's another problem we will study in this course. So that's called frequency regulation. Yes, so all of those controls, are they occurring independently at each, uh, at each power, power plant? Yes. At each power plant, okay. Yeah. Or it, it, are they independently at each power plant, or is there just one control system that monitors each? There is no monitoring. Okay. And think that the power grid uh, is started more than a century ago. Yeah. How come this is possible? Uh, we have this interconnection over the whole system. So the reason why this is possible is because all the generators we use are single generators. So they are all coupled together to the grid. The grid works at 60 hertz. And the rotation of this generator are, is proportional to the frequency in the grid. So they're all, in a way, coupled to each other. Yeah? So whenever there is an increase in the frequency in the grid, that is sending that signal. If you measure locally the, the frequency of the grid, you have a sense what is happening in the whole interconnection. So the, the grid itself acts as a the communication system, the signal to control it. So when, so depending on like where the generation that um, has a fault or the load will, does one go make the frequency increase and one make it go down or could it be either? For the oscillation, we observe that that can right. be different. It can be either. Yeah. But in the long run, because it's, it's like a whole mass of generators that are moving all together. In the foreground, all they need to convert to the same point. So that, that will happen. As you can see here in the in the animation, they are all, even though there is a failure, all the generators respond in the same fashion. 
they move together. They move together, but the frequency in them is not exactly the same because there is this other problem that is oscillations. There is energy that is being exchanged between the machine anyway, but as a group, all together they're moving because they're synchronous. When we start like developing the equation and putting this together, then probably we will have a better understanding of this phenomenon. Yeah, but that's a description of what happened with this problem. So, um, I'm going to ask you to check at the video and see the difference with the previous one and just bring your question on, on Friday if you have a question or, or you want to emphasize on something, we can spend some minutes next class talking about it. Now, we will not be able to work with the grid. Nobody will let us do that. Yeah? No, 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 no. We will not be able, like, in a lab, you can go and start playing this thing. So the only way to do it for us, simulation. And in this course, we will lay down the foundation for it. How we can simulate. What is simulating? What kind of model do we need? So we will talk about that. One complexity is the size. The interconnection in the country is so large. So to have a realistic model, we need to have a large mathematical model with a lot of variables and equations, and that is problematic, right? Um, so not only that, you have generators that are different because the technology is different. As we discussed so far, you have higher generation, you have thermal power plants, but thermal power plants are different types. You have nuclear, or based on coal, or based on gas. So the diversity of the behavior of this component is large. So it's not only that you have need to have a large mathematical model, but also each component is so different from each other. So that creates some problem for us when we, uh, to deal with it. So what do we do today? Well, basically we use commercial software that can deal with this large mathematical model and also, we have a large database with different components that we can use. In this course, though, we will use MATLAB. Are you okay with MATLAB? How do you use MATLAB? So we, we, we need to be realistic. We will not be able to simulate laser, laser interconnection, for example. But we will develop our model for systems that are small enough so we can study them in MATLAB. But we will study the oscillation and the frequency excursion. So model, what kind of model do we need? Well, we, we, we need a set of differential equations. Mathematically, whenever you see a differential equation, that means that that variable cannot change in concurrency. I gave a practical explanation on Monday, do you remember? Why a variable cannot change in concurrency? Who remember that part? Because there's some energy involved. There is energy involved. And the energy cannot change this frequency. You cannot create out of nothing energy, right? So it will need some time to develop. So whenever you see this mathematically, you need to make the connection with the practical concept that these store energy somehow. So this variable X must be related with some sort of energy. For example, an inductor. For an inductor, do you store energy in an inductor? Yes. In which form? Current. So your equation for that inductor needs to be with di dt. Some current needs to show up there. But what about a capacitor? Can it store? Yes. In a different way, though. Capacitor will store energy by storing voltage, charge. So in that case, your differential equation will be in terms of voltage. And we can keep developing this. So we talk about the kinetic energy. What do you think will be the state variable for the for the shaft of the generator? Angular speed. Angular speed, because that will be related with the kinetic energy, right? So whenever you see this, make the connection with the practical meaning of this. But we also have algebraic equations. This G, this establish a relationship between the state variables and the algebraic variables directly equal to zero. 
Now, what explanation we can have for this equation? These cannot change instantaneously, right? Because it needs to develop over time. What about this one? It's harder, right? Can it change y instantaneously? Yes. So because of this is equal to zero, y can change instantaneously. And I give an example on Monday. Who remember the example? I said the example of a car where you are driving a car in the highway. You need to use the brake because you need to stop. Something is on the way. But next to you, you have a train. And let's think that both we need to stop the train and the car. Who will stop faster? The car because it's so light. The energy stored in the car, the kinetic energy, is so little. So if our interest is on the most significant dynamics, which is the train. When we compare that behavior with the car, we can say, well, the car will stop instantaneously, right? By comparison, maybe the car will take a few seconds to stop. The train will take maybe almost a minute. So by comparison, you can think, sure, the car is stopping immediately, right? So the same idea here, we will use algebra equation. And these algebraic equation uh, means that these are components in the system that can store so little energy that we can ignore that and assume that they can change in the time. In the system, what is the most important thing? Machines, iterators, those are so heavy. They take time to develop. When you compare that with the energy stored in the inductance of a transmission line, that is nothing. So for the transmission line, we will use this type of behavior. And any other component that have little energy store. And here are some examples. You know, the carbon in the generator is also algebraic. Voltage is in different point of degree, also algebraic. They can change instantaneously. But this one is the map. These are involved with high energy that is stored in different fashion. Uh, I will pass this very quickly, but this is a snapshot of what we need to deal with. So, for example, here you have a typical model that we may use for a generator. Uh, we will not be able to find all the explanations how we develop this, but we will discuss this later in a bit more detail. But this represents the induction of voltage in the machine and the motion of the rotor in the machine. Together with this, we need algebra equations that are typically represented by a circuit. So this is a circuit that is connecting algebra variables with a state variable. They're all here. These will take time to develop, but whenever you have a value for this, that through the circuit, we define instantaneously what is the value for the algebra variables in the system? So this carbon can will be related to the energy stored in these inductances, but the energy is so little that we will assume that they can change instantaneously. Also, for the controllers, you may have a controller for voltage. This is a typical model for voltage control in a generator. Does this look familiar to you? Where have you seen this before? Signaling system. So this is a block diagram. And basically, we'll represent graphically a relationship between input and output, right? So here, depending on the input, you, are, you have a reference for the voltage. And you are subscribing to this reference the actual voltage you are getting. So this is a voltage error. So depending on this voltage error, what you want to do, process all of that and get what is the voltage you need to excite the generator. So it will establish a relationship between input and output. But this is the typical way you have studied this before. We like it because it's simple, but you can have a quick idea of how a controller is. But from here, you can de develop from here 
you can use it on the same equation that you need also for the same control. So we can use a graphical description or a mathematical description. These are equivalent. The same thing will be for the frequency control. We call it, or generator, we call it governor. That's the term. But if you go to an interview later this year, and they will ask you questions, they will ask you, what is a governor? A governor, that's the term that industry use is for frequency control. It will go through this during the semester. Dimension. So this is uh, seven minutes. This is something that uh, is critical. And here I have a system that is for academic purpose. There is no system like this. Uh, originally, I think that they use a very simplified version of the Western interconnection like this. Yeah? So these represent the South California, that area. These represent the state on the on the east side of the Western Interconnection. This is like Lehigh or Colorado or Nevada, that area. Utah, uh, and this might represent the Oregon or Washington, Canada. So they use this system many, many, many decades ago to understand a basic problem in, in the Western Interconnection. Today, we just use it as a academic system, a, a toy system, so we can test ideas. But in this system, you have three generators, transmission lines, transformers, and also here, I put an additional transformer and five wind turbines. So how big is the system we need to deal with? Here is the description. We need 72 differential equations with the state variables and 79 algebraic variables. These two this obtain the voltages and the current to degree. So in total, 152. Is that a problem? It can be a problem. So this system is simple, but look the number. Now I show you something else. Well, I am from Chile, so that's why I show you this. In the old time, we have the North part working in isolation. Very, a very small part of the country, but with high power because you have a lot of mining companies here. So this system is much larger. Here's an idea of the model. So we have almost 1,300 state variables, almost 2,000 algebraic variables at this size. Is that a complication? Yes, yes, it is. The computer now is. I don't have the number here. But it's all, you know, engineering. How we can have a good model that can describe this? How much variable? That's an issue. But can we come out with a model that is not that large in numbers and it still have an accurate description? That, that's, that's challenging. But uh, my estimate for a good model for this, maybe 900,000 variables, maybe. So that's the introduction. Um, I have five more minutes. And I put this in Canvas. Were you able to share uh, this file? Is, a, is that working? Yeah. So the first part also I put a document that is not complete. So I have that document for the first part, the mathematical description. And you can go through that. I hope that is clear enough. I provide details and examples so you can go through that. And the slides here are based on that document. Okay. So we will review the chapters that I have in that document uh, quickly using the slides here. The first part has to do with basic concepts. So as we need to come up with models and we need to understand variables. So one thing that it will be useful before we jump into the representation of the power system is to have a basic definition of the type of variables we will need. So there are kinematic variables and kinetic variables. Kinematic variable 
is related to displacement and flow. Displacement of what? Anything depends on the system you have. So if you have a linear movement, it is a position with respect to a reference. If you have a rotational system, it has to do with the angle of the rotation. It's a displacement. And what is the flow in that case here, linear movement? What is the flow? There's a speed. What is the flow here? Angular speed, right? What about for electrical circuit? What is displacement? And what is flow? Charge and how? So the other are kinetic variables, effort and momentum. For the electrical system, what would be the effort? What is momentum? Maybe that's harder. What, what is displacement and flow? We already said that, right? Um, let's, let's effort and momentum for the linear movement. What would be the effort we have here? Force. Force. And the momentum? Mass multiplied by the speed, right? That's momentum. What about here in rotational movement? It's not mass. How do we call it? Inertia. Inertia and rotational speed. What about for voltage? Did you say it? Effort? Yeah. Voltage, right? And momentum is that's pretty. I'm gonna guess uh, current times inductance. Yeah, perfect. Flux linkage. Perfect. Yeah. So those are the classification. And if we pick another system, believe me, we will be able to find the same reference. Okay. So in these, we can we can find um, variables. So we you didn't have a question. Oh no, I was just saying. Yeah, it's the uh, flux linkage is a unit that both sides. So, yes. Yes, I'm sorry about that. So we can think in terms of kinetic variables. We have momentum. What kind of energy do you think we can obtain there? It's just with the flow, momentum, the speed, right? Kinetic energy, right? Rotation here, kinetic energy. What what would be that kind of energy in an electrical circuit? Where do you have flow? Where do you store energy? Flow inductors, inductors. So that will be related with an inductor. And what about a capacitor? Does it behave in the same fashion? <coughs> no. So the capacitor behaves in a different way. What kind of energy we have is over there? Potential. Huh? Potential energy. Potential energy. So we we talk about this, but this uh, can go in a road going downhill. So you have kinetic energy, but what kind of other energy you have in that block moving, moving down field? Potential energy. So you have other type of energy as well. In the electrical system, that's going to be the energy stored in the capacitor. Potential energy. So that will be related with this type of power. That's what I taught in this uh, chapter. So I went over all of these is talking to you, but uh, go to that chapter and check each one of the examples in the definition we have for the variable. The displacement, the flow, the effort, and the momentum. And then at the end of that chapter, we will have the definition for the uh, in increment of work, power, and energy. Yeah. So the integral of the power, well, the power is the changes in the working time. That's the power. And the integral of this will give you the energy that you have in that component. But please review this, and what might be new for you is calculating these variables using different uh, omega, t, and e, using different type of variables, kinematic or kinetic variables. Yeah? So you can use the flow, the displacement, the effort, or the momentum. And we can come up with equivalent definition to take the same, same uh, variables for power and energy. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, guys. Uh, before I finish, I already put in Canvas the quiz. We're going to have the first quiz on Monday. 
So it's going to be available after class until midnight. It will take you five minutes, yeah? but you need to schedule your, your, your day so you can answer that during that time. Okay. Thank you, guys. See you on Friday.